Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. This is definitely going to be a fun one. We are going to do a follow up to our seven reasons why you should not buy vintage electronics. Vintage electronics have been a huge part of my life, especially the last seven years since I opened Skylabs. My love for vintage electronics has yet to wane. But before we get into it, I do want to make sure you understand I might say amplifier or receiver, and I'm referring to the same thing. I'm talking about what we think of as a traditional receiver or an integrated amplifier. I'm referring to the box that produces amplification. That makes sense. Oh, and one last thing, I, and then I promise we're getting into the video. This is my opinion. That's all this is. I appreciate that you all clicked on the video to hear my opinion, but please just keep that in mind. You know, this is just from experiences that I've had I am not the most versed in new modern gear. It just doesn't hold my interest like the vintage stuff does. So for whatever that's worth, it is what it is. And with that, let's dive in. And our number seven reason why you might wanna try vintage stereo equipment is you're looking for a new addiction or a new hobby or something in life that grabs you and makes you wanna get online and kinda do deep dives into the different manufacturers and what people's opinions are on how they sound, how they perform, how they look. And this hobby definitely seems to do that. There's an audio porn meme out there that I think really is relevant. And it's, it's funny because there's a lot of truth in it. When I really started getting into vintage audio, that was definitely me too. I was online all the time, just looking at all the different models, all the different series, I wanted to see everything that was manufactured back then. That is one of the cool things about this hobby in that I think so many people relate to it, even if they weren't part of it. A lot of people my age and a lot younger are attracted to this equipment just like I am. And that really goes to show you how well and how much thought they put into the design to make these really aesthetically pleasing. And I think that kind of explains that meme where you do kind of find yourself browsing eBay and Facebook groups and looking for that next shiny silver piece of equipment that we're all kind of in love with. And I think in the consumer electronics world, at least of today, it's just been priced out. The amount of money it would take to make a, a nice wood cabinet with aluminum face plates and steel chassis, it would just be so expensive. So if you love audio, you love music, and you're kind of looking for something that's a little bit more engaging. Vintage Electronics definitely has that draw. It will pull you in and take you down a rabbit hole that is, in my opinion, really fun. It's definitely the best addiction I've ever had. And this all might sound kind of odd, but I really do think this is a very manageable, healthy addiction. This isn't something you're gonna lose your family and your house over. At least I've never seen it go to that level. That's our number seven pick. You're looking for a new hobby. You're looking for kind of a new addiction. Vintage stereo equipment just might be the fix for you. And coming in at the number six spot is repairability. And really with 60s and 70s gear, the repairability on these is very high for a lot of reasons. One being there's not a lot of proprietary parts in the circuitry. These are all simple transistors, resistors, capacitors. There are very few exceptions, but there are some exceptions. And that's where with just a little bit of research, you can find out if there's a part inside that maybe people are having trouble tracking down. Now with vintage audio growing the legs it has and becoming so popular, some of those hard to find parts are starting to be remade. And I'm thinking face plates, STK packs, not to mention the amount of original parts that are out there. You have to think about how many thousands and thousands of these units they sold and maybe some that aren't repairable, people are parting out online. There's been very few times where I've had to put in a safe search on eBay and wait, you know, three or four months for a, for a replacement knob or a face plate or maybe a potentiometer or something like that. Most times I feel like when I do need a part, it's usually available on eBay or somewhere on the internet. Another thing that makes these vintage electronics so repairable is the knowledge base. And you have to think, People have been servicing these pieces of equipment since they were manufactured. So we've got 40, 50 years of people servicing them and sharing 
what fixed them, what works, what doesn't work, what you might want to look out for. Places like Audio Karma and Radio Antique Forums are full of people that are maybe retired. They enjoy helping somebody else. They enjoy passing on their knowledge. And that knowledge is out there and it's being preserved on a digital platform. You're not going to be able to find the knowledge like that on a piece of stereo equipment you purchased 10 years ago. Not only because there hasn't been that many years of people working on it, but also because a lot of the newer equipment really isn't serviceable. It's one of the reasons why modern electronics, once the warranty is up, are just disposable. I'm not talking about PS Audio, Macintosh, you know, the higher end brands. I'm talking about consumer electronics, Onkyo, Sony, Denon, Pioneer, those types. You know, they don't want you fixing their equipment. As far as I understand, the modern manufacturers have stopped all local support for repair shops. If you have an issue outside of warranty, most likely they're going to offer you a 15% discount on a new piece or something like that. It becomes legacy equipment. They stop manufacturing the parts. The boards are gone. And that's why at number six, we've got repairability. And coming in at number five, you prefer to keep your modern technology outside of your amplifier or receiver, and I definitely agree with this. And really with technology just advancing so quick, and you think about all the things that are incorporated into amplifiers and receivers today, you know, including Wi-Fi, HDMI, Bluetooth, DACs, streamers, voice control, there's just so many reasons why those products can get outdated, and, and they have. I, I, we've all been there where we get a different TV or a different component, maybe Xbox, whatever, and they've come out with a new HDMI that no longer passes audio through or no longer passes video through. Um, with everything incorporating into a whole home system as far as music distribution or control, it's really easy for a modern receiver or amplifier, what have you, to be outdated really within a couple years. And it really is just a trade-off. You know, if you don't want a second box for a, for a DAC or a streamer, um, you want everything built into one package, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just really going to shorten the amount of years that that piece of gear is viable or in which that it connects to other devices in your home. Personally, it doesn't bother me to have an external DAC or an external streamer. And in that way, I keep the amplifier or receiver I love, and then I just add my components to it. We actually did a video on this not too long ago, and it was how to add some of these accessories to a vintage receiver, stuff like a subwoofer, a streamer, DAC, even a remote control. I would just rather upgrade my DAC if I need to, or upgrade my streamer if I need to, rather than upgrading my whole system. So, And that's our number five spot. You would rather keep your modern technologies outside of your amplifier or receiver. And our number four spot, you like the thrill of the hunt. And I am really guilty of this one. There's nothing more I like than going to an estate sale or a garage sale, maybe even a thrift store, and finding a really nice set of speakers at a really good price. And they're still out there. This is one of those things that you have to do it quite often. Maybe 10 years ago, it was a different story. With everybody having eBay in their pocket, the thrift stores, garage sales, and those types of places have gotten really savvy to the prices that vintage equipment is at. I get stories all the time. You see stories on the Facebook groups all the time. And why some people may be stretching the truth, I've experienced it enough times to know that it happens. It definitely does. And I think a lot of it just is the sheer numbers of this equipment that were produced. I even remember when I would tell people I was opening up a vintage stereo store, so many people, the first thing they'd say would be, well, there can't be that much of this stuff out there. I mean, aren't you going to run out of product? And the amount of vintage stereo equipment that still comes in our doors on a regular basis, it almost blows me away. But that goes to show you how many of these pieces were manufactured and sold. I mean, it was everywhere. Everybody had a stereo. It's not like that today. So as of now, fortunately, I think there's still a lot of this stuff to be found in our grandparents' or parents' basements. Fortunately, we're not at the bottom yet. I hope it continues. I know it can't last forever, but we'll try. And that is our number four spot. 
you like the thrill of the hunt. And coming in at the number three spot, and maybe my personal favorite, is you like owning a piece of history. Most of these pieces of equipment are over 40 years old. They kind of have their own character. They have their own flaws. They're kind of a unique piece. You like knowing that somebody loved this piece of equipment and now it's yours and you get to experience its second life. For me, I kind of like to think about all the music that's been played through this piece of equipment. Maybe all the good times associated with it are kind of embedded in it in a way. Not to get too hippy dippy, but if music does bring people enjoyment and or if negative or positive experiences can be attached to something, then I would like to think that this piece of stereo equipment that I own now, maybe harness some of that good music along the way. And really, I understand if that type of thing doesn't appeal to you, you know, you would rather have a brand new piece of equipment that you know is in perfect pristine condition. But there's just something there for me that I like thinking about the history and where it's been and who owned it and who's enjoyed it. And I just like that for some reason. I don't know why that's different for me with stereo equipment. There's a lot of things out there I definitely prefer to have brand new. I kind of got a feeling there's more people out there that agree with me on that than, than don't. And definitely leave me a comment on that one. Do you feel like your vintage electronics kind of have their own soul or am I just drinking the Kool-Aid? Let me know. I'm curious. And coming in at the number two spot, definitely the most heated topic of this list. That is sound and build quality versus cost. I'm going to reiterate, this is just my opinion. It is very understandable that you have a completely different opinion. I'm just going to give you mine based on my experience with modern and vintage electronics. And that is, I don't think you can touch the sound and build quality of vintage consumer electronics with new modern consumer electronics. There are a few consumer manufacturers that are making good two-channel equipment. However, they only have a, a few models. Even going to Best Buy and putting two-channel receiver or two-channel amplifier into the search bar, I think, netted me three or four results. Um, Crutchfield had seven or eight. Some of the better ones, you know, you're talking five, six thousand dollars $6,000. And most of these are Class D amplifiers. Not to say there's anything wrong with Class D amplifiers. I just prefer analog Class A or Class AB. And actually, another YouTube channel, Stereo Niche, we'll put a link to this down in the description, did a really good job really breaking down cost comparison between a vintage receiver versus a modern one. He did the Yamaha, which is probably the best comparison, in my opinion, to do because really they're so similar in spec and they're obviously the same manufacturer. So if you really want to see a cost breakdown of what a modern receiver with the same build quality as a vintage receiver would cost, go check out that video by Stereo Niche. And one other thing I wanted to bring up on this topic is there really is a bargain side of vintage electronics, and that is the speakers. Vintage speakers are not going up in value as much as the receivers and the amplifiers. That is where the bargains can really be had in vintage. And once again, I know they've made massive advancements in speaker technology over the years. But when you can get a set of Advents or Boston Acoustics or even maybe a midline JBL for under the original price that they sold for in the 70s, these speakers still sound really, really good today. There are specific vintage speakers that have gone up a lot in value. And I'm thinking more like, you know, the high-end JBLs and the clips and those types of things. So if you're on the fence about vintage electronics in general, don't overlook vintage speakers. You can pick them up cheap. They're really easy to service and they sound really, really good. And that's our number two spot. That would be sound and build quality versus cost. And real quick, before we get into our next pick, I really want to say thank you to everybody that's liked, subscribed, shared videos. All those things really help us grow this channel and reach a new audience that might not know about us yet. And for those of you out there that are enjoying the videos, maybe you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining our membership program. We truly appreciate each and every one of you, so thank you. And coming in our number one spot, and I definitely don't think this should be your main reason for buying vintage stereo equipment. I just think it's a huge perk, and that is as an investment. 
And I really do think stereo equipment from the 60s and 70s, because of all the things we've talked about, is unique in that you have something old and cool that still gives you the same enjoyment as it was originally intended. And the ability to incorporate all these modern electronics with our vintage equipment, the repairability, and then the amount of them out there. I don't see vintage stereos dropping in value anytime soon. And that's just my opinion, but I do have quite a bit of skin in the game. And it's always possible that I'm wrong. And who knows, maybe I'll be putting my job application in it at a restaurant somewhere or something, but I don't think so. I, 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 I think this stereo equipment from this era has kind of proven itself. I don't think it's going down in value. And I don't think there's a lot of things that you can purchase today that are growing in value, especially consumer electronics. I don't think people are gonna be passing down AV equipment and modern consumer two-channel stereos to their children and grandchildren. I could be wrong on that too, but I don't think so. So if you look at it like this might be the last of the collectible consumer electronics, then it's not going anywhere. It's just gonna to continue to go up in value and people will continue to seek it out, like me. If the interest in vintage stereo equipment does start to wane, I will be picking up a lot of really cool pieces for very cheap. And I'll just enjoy them for what they are, which is a piece of history that will almost rival any piece of modern gear within reason, and especially for the cost. So those are our reasons for why you might want to check out vintage stereo equipment. I do recommend if you haven't seen the reasons why you might not want to buy vintage stereo equipment because there are some good reasons not to as well. I don't think vintage stereo equipment is for everybody, but for those of us that have caught the bug, I'm really glad to have something that I enjoy as much as I do, just a simple stereo system from, from what I consider the golden era. I think a lot of you do too. So yeah, I think we're in good company. I think this hobby's in good health right now. And that's one of the best perks of vintage audio is you can go out and buy it. If you can get it at a decent price, you can find out if it's right for you. And if not, most likely you're gonna be able to get your money back out of it. You might make a little money or you might do like our parents and grandparents did and just pass it down to another family member. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. I really hope to get a lot of comments on this video. I do read each and every single one of them. Share what got you into vintage audio, what your experience has been. Thank you so much. We'll see you in the next one.